Oh, welcome back. Okay, let's continue our discussion about culture. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how uh, some early anthropologists uh, and, and folks in general sort of considered culture. And we, we touched a little bit about this last week. Um, you know, early anthropologists um, described culture in, in, in different ways. And we had this idea of like social Darwinism um, and that the classif uh, classification of different cultures, um, such as savage, barbarian, and civilized, uh, were sort of based on these European um, ideals of what is civilized. And oftentimes with these, with this idea of social Darwinism is that your cultural identity would also be connected to your racial biology. Okay, what does that mean? Well, if your culture was seen as uh, savage or barbarian, then whatever race you were associated with was probably also going to be considered less than civilized, right? You had Europeans that were seen as the apex of uh, a people of evolution, um, of both cultural and biological evolution. And social Darwinism uh, was more about uh, yeah, if you are less than that European, uh, European idealized identity of, of civilization and you were considered a barbarian or savage, then you were not only less culturally, but less than human, right? Less than civilized. And therefore, the norms and beliefs and the morals that would normally be upheld you know, if you were a European, didn't always, you know, stand true to those that were considered to be barbarian or savage. Uh, this is um, in evidence by how we dealt with African Americans uh, or Africans at the time, and then eventually African Americans when we dealt with uh, slavery uh, and the, then Jim Crow laws and then to modern day issues. Uh, with social justice and, and all of this stuff. We, we still have a lot of issues going on there. But it was justifiable back then, right? Because this was sort of the world view, uh, or at least the European view, of uh, what was morally right and morally wrong. So uh, a lot of early anthropologists, a lot of early social scientists um, felt this way and this was sort of perpetuated within uh, uh, modern or at the time contemporary culture, right? Um, I talked a little bit about Franz Boas and, and Bronislav uh, Malinowski and about their more progressive ways of explaining things. Um, and, and so this is, this is really important to kind of get into. Uh, we've got Boas argued for historical particularism. Okay. And this approach basically um, got rid of the whole idea of uh, biology being connected to culture. Okay. Uh, basically said that um, your biology has nothing to do with your culture um, and that your given circumstances where you live um, makes you civilized. Right, because you have adapted to that environment. So the Inuit that Boaz worked with were just as civilized as the Europeans, even though the technological differences were pretty big, the adaptation to the environmental needs were the same, right? They were successful. As Inuit, they were successful in their environment. They survived. They thrived, and they were very, very uh, successful as uh, as a culture and as a people. Um, they just didn't conform to uh, these these uh, Eurocentric ideals, right? So 
his, his ideas about what is civilized changed a lot of what American anthropology would eventually become. Uh, you had Malinowski who worked with the, the British anthropology, and they, they worked with structural functionalism. Okay, and it kind of, it, it sort of dissected culture, again, taking away sort of the biology, but looking at, at, at culture in, in a very separate entity, as an entity in itself, right? Um, that instead of, you know, relegating it to, uh, you know, again, this, this uh, social Darwinism, they're like, okay, let's look at this culture as its own identity, we're going to look at its kinship, at its politics, at its as its religion, all of these different things, and then sort of analyze it and treat it independently uh, of other cultural identities. And that was again huge uh, for for the field of anthropology, um, not taking a moral approach to studying a culture, right? Whether or not it's less than. You know, if you treat something as less than when you go into it, you're not going to find a lot of things because you've already had that sort of uh, determination that this is less than, you know? But if you go into it looking at it as an equal, right, you will find equal parts. Um, but these are early anthropologists. These are early ideas. And they left things out, right? They were like good starts, you know? They, they, these were putting things back on the track, but we still had to deal with a few other things. Like they were experimenting with ideas of theory and they were, for the most part, trying to isolate a community. And communities aren't isolated, right? They have neighbors, right? And those neighbors have impacts on that community. So you have to understand that, yeah, uh, these folks over here are going to have an impact here. And a lot of early anthropologists didn't look at it. They just, they took a look at that culture as a static moment in time, uh, a snapshot, if you will. And that's what they studied uh, and didn't really take into account a lot of um, external or time-related issues. Um... So there, there's been a number of ways that we've changed and adapt, uh, adapted to uh, continually looking at anthropology as, as we deal with new ideas, new subjects. Uh, Clifford Gertz describes the interpretist approach, um, sort of dealing with different ideas about uh, how culture can be examined, okay? Uh, so one example would be like, uh, what, what does a, a wink mean to someone? You know, if I wink at you, right, it's kind of a conspiratorial wink, right? Or a sly wink, like, you know, or a sexy wink, like, yeah, you know, uh, that probably wasn't. Uh, anyway, but what does it mean? And different cultures have different meanings for different things, right? Um, we can, what, what Gertz was looking at was actually diving in a little bit deeper into that culture. And, and he does what, what he calls the, the thick description. And the thick description really focuses on um, going into one aspect of that culture and trying to understand it in depth. And I mean in depth, right? Um, so, for example, uh, let's, take, let's take football. Uh, I, I, I like football most of the time. Uh, I didn't pay any attention this year uh, to football. So, uh, I don't even know who's going to the Super Bowl this year. It's, I don't care. Um, but, as an activity within our culture, football is actually really important. Um, so, there's a number of things. Uh, that it that it does it has a um, it creates an identity within uh, our culture so we identify with certain teams we back them so we've got the uh, the, the Denver Broncos here in Denver um, which a lot of people follow and they you know they support them they go to the games they buy their uh, their merchandise and all of that stuff they 
uh, enjoy watching the games. But it goes beyond just watching the games, right? Uh, how, do, how do the teams interact with each other? What kind of culture is there? You know, why is there a rivalry between like the Raiders and the Broncos and the Chiefs? You know, what's going on there and, and, and the Patriots, you know? Um, you know, why do we create all this? And then what happens when we gather, you know, when we go to the stadium and actually watch the game and come together as a community or when we stay at home? You know, what happens when we get together every week, right? Because, well, and of course, in a pandemic, that's not happening nearly as much as it used to. But, you know, let's go back like a year and, and say, okay, so what was happening with, uh, uh, with games? It, this was a time for families to gather, right? To uh, show up and have a barbecue, uh, to share food, right? Everybody would bring a dish. Um, so you'd have like a potluck, you know? So you'd, you'd be uh, coming together with friends and family. You'd be spending time together. You'd be recalling different stories, uh, of previous games or of other events going on. Uh, you're sharing uh, uh, resources uh, so that, you know, you're bringing in food or other things. Um, so it's a time for gathering, right? It's, it's people coming together. And they're coming together under, you know, this, uh, the, this, uh, uh, the flag of, of their favorite team, you know, that's going into battle. Um, it's a separation uh, from the daily grind, right? This usually happens like once a week, right? Uh, it's a time to relax. It's a time to forget your job, right? Uh, it's a time to forget all the things that you have to do on a regular basis. Um, so it's that separation, it's recreation. Um, it can change the mood of an entire city, right? If, if the Broncos were to win the Super Bowl, you know, everything goes crazy and wild, right? There's parades, and uh, people come out in, in, in the thousands to, to see their players and they do a parade and it's, it's all fun, right? And everybody's happy. And the losing team, you know, man, that, that sucks because, you know, you went to the Super Bowl and you lost. And that's, that's a hard thing to, to live down. Um, you know, the, the, the players can be idolized, right? We, we look at, uh, at athletes and we idolize them for their strength, for their, uh, their athletic ability, uh, for how talented they are, uh, for how much effort they put into becoming that talented. You know, so we, we look at this and, you know, if you think about how many people are actually in, let's say the NFL, you got 32 teams with 52 players per each team, right? That's, that's not a whole lot of people, right? That's uh, a few thousand uh, that are going to be in this whole thing together. And yet it encourages uh, hundreds of thousands of kids to uh, play football in Little League and high school and go on to college. You know, the likelihood of you actually becoming a professional football player is super, super, super slim. But doesn't mean that it doesn't encourage people to try, you know, uh, and, and to, to try and get to that level. So there's a certain ideology that comes along with, uh, with this. And then we can also look at like the, the medical issues, uh, dealing with like concussions, you know, uh, dealing with high impact, uh, sports, dealing with, uh, issues of, you know, treating your body uh, like a punching bag, right? You, you are strong, you're muscular, but what happens when you retire? And remember that most people retire before the age of 30, okay? Um, and if you've ever looked at sort of the results of what happens to football players after the age of 30, man, uh, talk about broken, like broken those bodies are oftentimes just broken. You know, uh, there are all kinds of issues that, uh, that these folks are going to face for the rest of their lives 
because they were so intense in their training and the application of their bodies and, and the pain that they had to go through and then the injuries uh, that will have a lasting effect at such an early age as well. Um, and then we also see like the political side, you know, um, you know, some people believe that sports should be relegated to sports and uh, that it should be just entertainment. And sports has rarely ever been just related to entertainment. There's oftentimes some sort of political issue that is associated with sports in general. You know, in, in the United States, that has been a constant theme. You know, whether it's racial equality or gender equality, um, you know, it has always been a constant uh, issue that we have been dealing with. So, you know, it, it kind of depends on, uh, on your perception of what, you know, sports should be, you know, and what sports often actually are, right? This sort of um, idealized or theoretical idea versus the ground truth. Right, of, of what's actually happening. And sports is oftentimes connected to, um, you know, what's happening within those uh, areas. So, you know, and, and we can look at things like, you know, uh, Kaepernick, um, who uh, kneeled um, in support of, like, Black Lives Matters and uh, social justice and all of this stuff and what a huge backlash there was and how big of an impact it had on him uh, on a professional scale, but his impact on politics became massive, um, not only within the sports realm, but within uh, all kinds of other realms. And so, um, you know, understanding that, you know, and how that, that um, sort of makes sports uh, uh, even more prominent within politics whether you agree with it or not, right? Um, as anthropologists, we, we're not looking to whether or not we agree with things. It's how we see things and how we can organize things and understand things. Whether or not we agree with it is one thing altogether different. Um, what Gertz and, uh, and Boaz and Malinowski all sort of left out were sort of these ideas uh, on, um, on power, right? Uh, a lot of times uh, when, when studying cultures, early anthropologists didn't necessarily connect ideas and, and constructs of power uh, and how much of an impact power has in a culture and where that power comes from. You know, whether it is uh, the ability to influence uh, change within a community or to uh, hold back change, uh, whether it's wielded by a, uh, an individual or a group or an institution, um, whether it's done through uh, uh, the dissemination of information, just talking or whatever, or if it's done through force or threat of force, um, and power creates different structures within society. So, you know, you, you create the, the haves and the have-nots. Uh, you create different social uh, 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 statuses and, and, and where people fit into these different areas, you know, based upon... Um, you know, their, their economic resources, their cultural influence, their racial identity or ethnic identity, uh, their gender uh, or sexuality, you know, all of these things can, can be created um, within these power structures and, and how do people fit into those. Um, you know, and it, 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 we can kind of look at different power structures within, as an example, like the classroom. Right, um, as as your faculty member, as your as your professor, I have a certain amount of power because I I will give you a grade at the end of the semester, and if you play by the rules and do all the things you're supposed to do, you know you will succeed and you will get that good grade. Um, 
But then there's also my place within the faculty realm, and I'm, I'm just an adjunct faculty member. So I'm pretty low on the totem pole when it comes to how much authority I actually have. Uh, people with more experience or more education will have more than me. Uh, and then you've got uh, departments, so whole departments, and you'll have somebody that's in charge, a chair uh, of that department, and how much influence they have. And then you've got vice provosts and vice presidents and presidents and, uh, and councils and all kinds of stuff that, you know, have different levels of power and structure and where do you fit in that power structure. Um, and that can kind of determine what your responsibilities are. Uh, within that community. So, uh, you know, universities and, and institutions themselves have uh, varying degrees of, of power. Um, you know, one of the things that we value in, uh, in America, for the most part, is education, right? Making sure that everyone gets a good education. Uh, and oftentimes it's seen as college is the, the way to do that. Um, you know, but what does that, what does that actually look like? And how is college now structured to be able to, uh, give people that opportunity? And there are some very, very interesting questions going on, uh, that we'll, uh, discuss at a later point concerning those issues. 